welcome to High Noon, where we discuss controversial subjects with interesting people. I'm Inez Stepman, your host, and our guest this week is Melissa Chen. You can find Melissa's columns at The Spectator USA, where she writes on subjects ranging from a relationship with China to domestic issues of free speech and identity. She's also the managing director of Ideas Beyond Borders, a nonprofit that translates Enlightenment ideas and writings into Arabic and Farsi. She's also on the advisory board for the fantastic new organization, FAIR, that's Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, which uh, I'm a huge fan of and hope to have lots of folks from, from uh, that organization on High Noon um, to discuss their very important work. But um, Melissa, it is wonderful to have you. Welcome to High Noon. Thanks, Inez, for having me. So, so tell us a little bit, just to kick it off, about how you came to be interested in, in subjects on in that kind of intersection of free speech and open versus closed societies and how those ideas interact with cultures and regimes all around the world. So I actually grew up in oh, somewhat closed society in, in a sense. It, it, it felt closed because we didn't have you know certain freedoms that a lot of Americans take for granted. Um, in Singapore, you do have a very paternalistic government, uh, you know, when when the government decided that there was just too much litter, you know, people were chewing gum and it was just being strewn all over the place, they decided to ban it. So that's the kind of, you know, the, the kind of government that I grew up under. Um, and, but for the most part, you know, it was, it was very prosperous. Um, it's very easy to start a business. Fiscal conservatives would, would love, you know, the, the policies of, of the ruling party because it's, low taxes and, and, you know, just a very vibrant kind of business hub. Um, but on the other end of it, you know, there, it's not known at all for having freedom of speech, for example, or freedom of the press, which actually ranks, Singapore ranks about 158th out of 170 countries in the world. And it's below, you know, Russia and Libya. Um, so I, I sort of always looked to the United States as the, you know, the shining city on the hill. I wanted to immigrate there because um, for me, those values were, were really important. Um, not just at the abstract level, because I, I kind of understood that if you grew up in a place where there are like potentially just all these minefields of no-go zones about, you know, when it comes to speech, you start self-censoring and it affects it affects people it affects the kinds of conversations you have it, it, it it's there's a burden almost on your shoulder as you navigate through society and i i just wanted to be able to be free so i i moved here and you know it was really for me the i, I went to college in like 2005 that's when i started and and back then, you know, before a lot of the campus shenanigans that we see started surfacing, um, it felt I got the college experience I wanted. You know, I was able to sit under oak trees and, and debate secular transcendentalism with, you know, with other people. And the I remember the, the head of the college Democrats used to always come to my dorm and we would argue about economics because I was, you know, I was taking Econ 101 at the time. And I thought I knew everything about, about Bush policies. And it, it was exactly that experience that I imagined. And, you know, when things started turning later on, um, I, I was very vocal about it because for me coming to the United States was actually very, was a very ideological choice. Um, and, and many people that I saw kind of um, agitating for, for a more close society, close, especially in terms of uh, political freedom, I, you know, it was anathema to me. It's like, you have no idea um, what what freedoms that you know you're you're just taking all these freedoms for granted. Yeah, I, I think um, a lot of times you say you made a choice to be American, right? If, if you are coming in from uh, a different culture or a different country, um, you have to kind of piece together what our regime actually looks like and what you know being an American actually means because it's it's not obvious at all, um, especially given what we teach today and in, in, in from most of our institutions, right? Whether that's K twelve universities or um, or uh, our, our corporations at this point, and, and we will get to all of that. Um, but I, I want to ask first. So um, China is another place where we see the split between there's some economic liberalization and has been at least initially if for the last couple decades, there's been some economic liberalization there. Um, it has not come along with social liberalization. It has not come along with liberal democracy or um, human rights or natural rights or free speech or any of the things that we thought 
um, back in the 90s and early 2000s, we thought, one, these things tend to go together, that if we liberalize on the economic side or we see China liberalizing on the economic side, that inevitably um, social liberalization would follow. Well, that turned out to be completely false. Um, and, and on the other hand, we had this, to me, now we're looking back, it seems like such a naive assumption that um, we would engage with China and we would feed a little bit of ourselves into their culture, right? That we would inject a certain amount of liberalism into their culture. And increasingly what seems, what seems like is happening is they're using that economic liberalization to feed authoritarian elements, authoritarian elements into our culture or into our politics. Um, when I think of examples like the NBA, uh, Flapper, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, the way that Hollywood now avoids storylines or elements or characters that might offend the CCP. I mean, how, how did we get China so incredibly wrong in the 90s and 2000s? I mean, it seems like there's still a few people um, who are, are really uh, clinging to that notion. But how, how did we get them so incredibly wrong? I mean, I think it was naivete um, for the longest time. I mean, ever since Nixon opened China up. Um, it really did seem like China was making inroads in 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 liberalizing their markets. Um, Deng Xiaoping, you know, when he instituted these market reforms, I mean, did an amazing job. I mean, China did actually lift millions and millions of people out of poverty into the middle class. Um, and it was a reasonable assumption at the time. I mean, it was popularized by by Milton Friedman. Um, that as long as, you know, you had economic liberalization over time, people will get more prosperous and, and demand for, for political freedoms. Um, but that turned out to be one of the biggest miscalculations of, of our time. Um, and I don't think it's limited to China. You do see that in other parts of Asia as well. So like in some of the Gulf states, for example, um, they have very high GDP per capita, very high standard of living, um, but they but they still, you know, are not, are still politically repressed in many respects. Uh, they, they don't enjoy uh, gay rights. They, you know, are, I, I don't, I don't even know if they, they can vote for, for, their, for their leaders. So they don't really enjoy uh, political freedoms as we expect them to given the high standard of, of living that they have. And I think it's, is this like, you know, is this a, a cultural misunderstanding? Um, I always like liken it to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, not everybody cares about self-actualization or, or, or people's conception of, of self-actualization is actually very different. And so as long as basic needs are met, um, you know, food, um, and, and in some of these cases, it's even like luxury goods, right? Like in China, the luxury market is very huge. Um, it's, it's a very like kind of materialistic way of, of, of living. Um, but as long as those things are met and people are comfortable and people are safe, what what is the need for this abstract political rights you know that that we think that they want and and so like america keeps trying to export these ideas but as long as china controls information sphere as china as the chinese communist party does with a great firewall um we can't reach them so it's not a two-way street you know, they, their tentacles can extend beyond their borders and affect America. They can influence us, you know, through many different ways because we have an open society and, and it can be hacked by a closed society. And, and we don't have that two way street because we can't influence them. And so I don't think that, I think that was one of the biggest uh, mistakes. I think we assumed that eventually they will have to tear down that wall, right? Bill Clinton famously said um, about, he laughed at the face, at the idea of Chinese censorship. He said, you know, ha, huh, the Chinese want to control the internet. That's like, that's like trying to nail Jello to the wall. And then like the audience laughs. Um, and, and so there was this idea that there was no way they could do it, but China did it and, and did it really well. And now that model, I think is being exported to other parts of the world. Yeah, and they, they did it with the help of American tech companies and in, in large part in terms of controlling the internet. Um, but what should we do in the United States then in terms of engaging with China going forward in a, a less naive way? It, it seemed like there was this moment um, in the pandemic early on 
where uh, we were getting a crash course and how dangerous um, some of this economic entanglement might actually be, that it, it wasn't all to the good. It wasn't, um, you know, sort of an escalating ladder that w of, of success and prosperity that was working for everybody. Um, but we, we got a crash course in, in what it means not to have, for example, pharmaceutical chains at home or, or um, PPP, uh, PPE chains at home. Um, and it seemed for a while that we were in, engaging with that idea and then it just seemed to peter out, right? Um, it wasn't very much part of the discussion. It was kind of shocking how little China was a part of, of the presidential election in 2020. There weren't a lot of questions about foreign policy. Um, you know, both candidates were not pressed on what we should do with China going forward with regard to China. Um, and then in, in his recent joint session um, address, Biden referenced China, I noticed, only in, in kind of a way that almost seemed like a throwback, like um, a kind of mild language of economic competition and making sure that's fair economic competition, but without any real teeth or threats. And then um, vague references to human rights um, and then a lot of references to climate change. Right. Um, but ha are we slipping back into a naive mm -hmm. way of looking at China and if we are, how can we change that going forward? I mean, what needs to happen if, if, if Melissa Chen was in charge of our foreign policy, or not just foreign policy on all the specifics, but um, on, on our mindset towards engaging with China? I mean, uh, what would that look like? So there's Biden's rhetoric, and then there's Biden's team's rhetoric, Lincoln and his other you know, foreign policy team. And then there's policy, like what they're actually doing. Um, I think you're right about the, the reckoning um, you know, I think most Americans, if you look at Gallup poll, um, they showed that I think in 2020, the way that Americans started viewing China unfavorably at a rate of like 80 percent. And, and it was it's such a bipartisan issue. Um, both, you know, both parties do actually believe now that that, you know, China is probably the biggest global threat, even though I think Biden said something about North Korea in his speech. So there, there is a sense that something is slipping um, and, and also because of wanting to get concessions on climate change and, and sort of you know, agree, like what leverage do you give up to China in order to get those concessions? And we all know that a lot of the, the, the Chinese rhetoric on climate change is actually just empty promises because you know, they want to be carbon neutral by, I think their goal was 2030, but, but they're building more and more coal plants around the world and their Belt and Road Initiative actually involves um, building all this infrastructure which is, and, and coal which, and power plants, which is even more coal into the, even more carbon dioxide into the air. Um, so it's, it's really hard to take their, their claims at face value. And it seems to me that what this administration is missing is that even plays like, um, even things like climate change, topics like climate change, this is a soft power play for, for Beijing. They know that if they can position themselves as a leader, as a climate leader, world climate leader, they're going to be able to, to, to get a lot of moral currency out of that because that's what the Europeans and that's what the West um, actually values. Um, and, and so they know that this is an, just another bargaining chip um, you know, in, their, in their pocket. Um, I, I do worry about uh, the Taiwan issue in the next, you know, I mean, the Navy had put out a report saying that uh, China invading Taiwan is is likely in the next seven years um, and, and how a Biden administration will respond to that. I, I, I was surprised, as you said, that, you know, during the primary, this this question wasn't asked because um, I just think of the, 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 the consequences of something like that. Um, just the the fact that you know this is taiwan is currently a sitting duck we know that you know what china's policy is towards that and it's it's a it's a you know functioning democracy so it's it's hard to say but i i do agree with you that it seems like things are slipping a little in terms of rhetoric and in terms of of policy the one thing Biden administration is pretty good about doing is framing things in terms of human rights um so I think he, you know, Blinken did continue Pompeo's initial declaration that uh, what's happening in Xinjiang is is actually a genocide. Um, and in terms of what we're going to do to counter this, because I think China basically showed its cards in the last year or so, especially. Um, you know, there 
the world kind of woke up to um, the the aggressiveness of, of the Chinese Communist Party, not just in terms of not being a responsible world actor um, when it came to COVID and how, you know, in the, in the early days it tried to cover everything up and it wasn't acting responsibly, um, but that also, you know, uh, there have been quite a few expansionist kind of military incursions. Uh, what's going on between China and India on the border of Ladakh? Um, what's going on in the South China Sea, where, where China's been very aggressive to the point of, um, you know, they're militarizing these islands and angering Vietnam, Philippines, and basically all the other countries. Um, and and then with its what it started to do after coronavirus, you know, in terms of hoarding PPE supply and, and waking America up to this, oh my gosh, you know, it turns out that this is a national security issue. Um, you know, for, for so for so long we we thought outsourcing was the way to go, you know, this the it was the glo globalization dream. Um, but we outsourced our way into a very tough position when it came to um, needing some items for, for, you know, to contain the pandemic or to prevent the spread. Um, so I think a lot of people are just like, okay, this is an issue that we need to solve. Supply chain sovereignty is, you know, we have to think of ways to decouple from the, from, from the Chinese government. Um, and also because they don't have any separation between industry and government in America, we do. So, any kind of business that you you have over there, somebody on the board of, of the company has to actually be, you know, a, a member of, of the, the Communist Party. And so the influence of government on, on these companies are is very heavy. It's not like in the United States where we really have a separation. Um, and I, I just think like we have to identify all areas in which, you know, it is dangerous to allow China or any Chinese company to participate. A good example of this is the electric grid. Um, I think the Trump administration had, had passed legislation um, saying that any co any company that you know um, is involved with, with with the Chinese government cannot actually um, have any parts contribute to any parts that uh, that that play a role in our electrical grid. Um, so. All these areas have to be identified. What are critical for our national security, um, and and you know where we can start decoupling and and build up supply chains that are completely independent that would leave us resilient in in a world where there might be you know more aftershocks. I mean, how how do we go about doing that? Given as you say that. Um, you know, generally, the United States government doesn't sit on the boards of our our corporations, um, and we have a real problem because of essentially because we are a free society, right? Because these companies are looking for profits in China, um, and there is that huge market, and so so um, you know so so many profits. I don't think that's actually the right way to say it. Such large profit um, yeah. to, to be had in that market that they're often willing um, sometimes to to sell some the keys to the kingdom in a certain sense um they're they're willing to do that to get access to that market they're willing to help the chinese government um s apply its internet censorship against its own people they're willing to do all kinds of things and these are of course companies that at home are um, all about black lives matter and and are engaging on um, voting issues at home and and yet they are totally willing and to sell the, the keys to the kingdom when they engage with China because those dollar signs are just so huge. The Chinese market is so huge. I mean, how do we balance between the positives of a free market economy, which is more dynamic and prosperous? I agree with all of those um, kind of traditional conservative or libertarian principles, uh, but how do we balance it with national security? And, and even more trickily, how do we balance you know, what we tell American companies, what they can and cannot do um, with regard to China, because it, it really seems like in the last few decades uh, that they, they haven't acted as, as sort of responsible or patriotic actors. They've acted as multinational companies mm -hmm. and they are chasing their profits regardless of the consequences for the United States. I can see like two ways forward. One of them is, is obviously legislation. Trump, during his administration, they did pass something called the National Security Innovation Base. Um, they define what industries were, were crucial. So it could be something like 
maybe AI, because AI is the next frontier, or like I said about the electrical grid. Um, you know, certainly things like anything involved in military production is considered part of that. Um, and now it's pretty clear that pharmaceuticals, vaccine, raw materials, all of this should be included under, under this uh, innovation base. Um, and, and to to legislate, you know, like if you're involved in these areas, well, you shouldn't be doing business in China or you shouldn't be, um, you know, you shouldn't be like having this kind of like exchange. It's, it's just, you know, it's part of our national security agenda now moving forward. The other thing, the other thing we can do is probably shame or awareness. I, I think, you know, what you brought up about, um, about companies that, that kind of virtue signal here, but then still have no qualms about filming in Xinjiang or, in, or using cotton picked by people enslaved by the Uyghur Muslims enslaved in Xinjiang. I mean, I think that it, it's one of the biggest hypocrisies of our time and it, it just lays it out just so barely what is going on. Um, and I, I, I do think that, you know, when companies ha are basically like trying to satisfy their profit motive, the other thing that American consumers can do if we can really muscle up that that power, that collective power, is is say, you know what, I'm going to boycott Disney. I'm going to boycott Disney Plus. Or you know, if we don't let companies know that their pocketbooks can also be affected on the other end, I don't know how we can win this. I mean, shaming kind of works sometimes but but we it, it, we need a stronger we need a stronger message we need a we need a stronger lobby in a way to to target these companies i mean i i think lately i have noticed that um you know like people like lebron james have gotten a lot of pushback even in in, in twi on the twitter sphere and elsewhere um because you know he's so willing to criticize what's going on in america um and, and about you know what's going on in law enforcement and police brutality, but but very slow to do it when his pocketbook is concerned because he makes a lot of money in China when it comes to sneaker deals and 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 contracts that the NBA has with with Chinese CCTV um, broadcasters. Um, so so that's all the negative and the the difficult things that um, the United States will have to face in in the coming years, but. Um, Maybe let's look a little more positively. What what would a, a positive engagement with China look like? And here I'm thinking less about the CCP. It seems obvious to me that there is not really a positive engagement to be had with the CCP. Um, I but yeah. I guess my, my question here is more, um, does it merely require a new regime in China um, that as long as the CCP is in charge in China that we can't ex expect positive engagement. I think we probably agree there. But then my my other question would be, is there some kind of underlying civilizational conflict between China and the West, you know, in a deeper, more broad sense that actually um, goes beyond the particularities of the CCP regime? Or are these two civilizations that maybe have in some ways complementary strengths or, or um, weaknesses that balance each other that can coexist um, as I said leaving aside the CCP I'm not I'm not like naive about this but on a civilizational level do we have things to learn from each other do do are, is it a, a peaceful coexistence or even a positive coexistence possible between these two huge civilizations and powerful civilizations um, I, I think the answer is yes um, you know for China, well, the CCP does like to point out that this is civilizational. They always draw on the fact that, you know, this China is a 5,000 year old civilization, um, which, which is interesting because they cut off, you know, they cut off that civilization. They, the Chinese Communist Party was founded in the 1940s. And, and um, they also rewrote their history. They got rid of a lot of things that were considered traditional during the Cultural Revolution. They got rid of a lot of intellectuals, um, a lot of aspects of Chinese culture. Um, they were very selective. They kept some parts, they discarded other parts. Um, and, and so for them to claim, for the Chinese Communist Party to be the to, to claim to be like the standard bearer of, of Chinese civilization is, is misguided. But there is such a thing as, as values and history and philosophy that goes you know, all the way back. Um, I think one of the things we 
China studies us very well and they understand the West very well. They study our philosophers, they know how we think. Um, that is one piece that is missing because we don't understand China. We don't understand Chinese philosophy. Um, I, I, how many you know philosophy students have learned about uh, Sun Tzu or Lao Tzu or, or Confucius? And and you know those philosophies really undergird so much of Chinese society, Chinese philosophy, and and it trickles all the way up. Um, you can you can see like even in just like reading some of these texts that are put out by the Communist Party, why why that you know there is such an alignment uh, in terms of political ideology with with philosophy, um, and and it's it's a shame that we don't actually study this because we're missing out that piece. And I think when you ask one of the, the, the first question you asked about why we miss this, I think the naivete kind of stemmed a little bit from this lack of understanding about the cultural clashes. However, that said, um, you know, I, I am very optimistic. If you look at the examples of Hong Kong and Taiwan, I mean, these are natural laboratories for what happens when you meld um, the culture with, with sort of Western tenets of governance, amazing things can happen. Right, so it's not it's not just a fatalistic thing. They're bound to be different. I mean, they they, they can't. Chinese culture adapts and adapts very well to to a very politically free kind of systems that we have. Like uh, in in Hong Kong's case, look, it's it's been one of the you know it's been the freest city in all of Asia for decades, and until you know the the Communist Party started rolling back those freedoms you know, maybe like 2014, that's when it really started. And it's ramped up throughout 2019. That's when it kind of reached its apex. And now, I, you know, you could safely say Hong Kong is lost or gone. Hong Kong as we know it. Um, it and, and how successful, you know, these uh, Chinese majority systems are with Western forms of government. Um, Taiwan, for example, is a paragon of of um, democracy and also how it handled COVID. I mean, a lot of people give its government plaudits for for just doing a really good job for good governance, um, but for having the kind of democracy that that is, you know, just oh, and not not just democracy, but also I think Taiwan was the first country in all of Asia to legalize gay marriage. So it's it is by all accounts a, a free, prosperous, you know. They educate their citizens there very well. They have actually, I think they have universal health care. Um, and it, it is a, a great example of what happens when you meld Chinese culture with, um, with Western governance. So you obviously have this uh, deep commitment, not only by actually, you know, voting with your feet, as it were, and coming to um, America where the government does have um, commitments, the system has commitments to what are essentially, at least in part, Enlightenment ideas. I mean, of course, I would argue that uh, the American founding was a mix of both uh, Enlightenment ideas and tempered by other forces like Christianity and and um, a certain sense of the classics as well, the ancients. Um, but uh, one thing that your organization did, as I asked you initially, was was trace um, sort of translate some of these um, ideas into the Middle East, um, in, into uh, into countries in the Middle East, either in Arabic or in Farsi. Um, you know, it's not clear that here at home um, we are fully behind those ideas either. As I said, we that we always had a bit of a mixed society philosophically. Um, but I think you have real serious critiques um, now from the left and the right of this liberalism that you say melds quite well um, in, in Taiwan or in um, Hong Kong. We have serious critiques here at home in the West, right? Of course, you have this sort of loss of confidence um, from the left. We have the 1619 Project or um, Ibram Kendi's critique. His first book was called Stamped from the Beginning. Um, and it, it is exactly what it sounds like that, that in fact, uh, these ideas, these liberal ideas are just cover for a, a white supremacist society or an oppressive society. 
Um, and then from the right, there seem to be more people who are, are questioning or critiquing the Enlightenment, um, pointing to things like rising atomization or the disintegration of institutions like family or churches or communities on exactly that altar of either commercialization or um, individual fulfillment or self-actualization, I think is the words that are the words that you used earlier. I mean, how do you answer those critiques at home, especially in the light of in light of the fact that we do seem to be gearing up for this this big battle with a totally different authoritarian type of system, um, but we we seem to be we seem to be wobbling at home and not just in the obvious way from from the left, um, but but with more serious critiques of some of the weaknesses of our own our own liberal system. I mean, I, I have to ask the question to myself, especially today when one of the ways that the government, you know, that, that people are, can push back on something like critical race theory in schools is passing legislation to ban it. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's that kind of questions about liberalism and how, you know, do, what can we preserve in order to push back something so illiberal and, and it seems to be in conflict. Um, so I think the, the arguments against the Enlightenment from the left and the right, I mean, while they, they sound this, this, substantially they sound the same, um, are actually very different, right? So the problem with the left is that the left refuses to acknowledge progress. And, and, and they also kind of peg all of Western, Western civilization's sins on liberalism. They, they say that, you know, uh, slavery, for example, or slavery was a result of the Enlightenment. You can draw a direct line between um, Enlightenment values and and slavery and, you know, colonialism and all of that, so on and so forth. Um, and on, on the right, I think the critique of the Enlightenment is that um, in Sorab Arami's piece recently, he, he wrote that the seeds of tyranny are, are already sowed um, in, in liberalism, um, that eventually if you let liberalism run its course, you will, you know, get kind of like what happened during the reign of terror in, in France. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, it's, both are committing a very similar mistake, which is to um, kind of do this sweep of history and taint everything that happened after it as a direct result of, say, certain values. But I, I just don't think we can throw the baby out with the bathwater on, on enlightenment values. I think when it comes to science, humanism, reason, and progress, that that these values, you know, are somewhat responsible for ushering a very new age in human history um, that, that counter, you know, previous kinds of tyranny imposed by the state uh, you know, the, the tyranny of the Catholic Church at the time, um, that was a very strong overriding force that you know, forced Voltaire to, to live in exile for, you know, a, a long period of his life. And, and that those principles have something to, to usher in, in terms of hard-won rights, progress. Um, the whole concept of natural rights came from Enlightenment values and human rights as well. Um, so, I'm, I'm reluctant to discard the whole project, but we have to acknowledge the hubris of the, Enli of the Enlightenment as well. I think, I think, you know, if we run the tape backwards, th there are ways to argue that the Enlightenment project has not delivered fully or has failed in some respects. Um, and one of which may be the, you know, the inclination to try to correct human nature or to, to sort of, um, create a utopia where, where human nature is totally different from what it actually is. Um, and so I, th I think it's important to, to realize that, you know, a big part of this drive for equality around the world, for safeguarding minority rights, a lot of that came from Enlightenment era philosophy, but that if left, you know, to, that there are certain ways to interpret it and that, that could lead to a very illiberal kind of reaction to it. Um, I think that's how I would respond to that. Yeah, I, I, I have this, a, a bit of the same critique, I think. Um, I, I find it kind of an implausible, right, that 
with all of the intervening intellectual developments and, you know, actual material developments, let's say between Thomas Jefferson writing the Declaration of Independence and the, you know, sexual revolution in the United States in, in the late 1960s, um, that you can draw that kind of sweeping direct line. But I, I agree with you, there, there are antecedents. And if you squint, you can see, okay, maybe some of these ideas are the evolution of these prior ideas. But it, it almost, hilariously enough, it almost seems like sort of directionality of history arguments to me, right. like, um, like Hegel or, or like a, a sort of Marxist view of history where we're just progressing and we're, we're um, jockeying out the final sort of logical conclusion of ideas. And I just think history is much more complicated than that. And even the way we live our lives within a regime is so much more complicated than that, that I, I'm skeptical of those kinds of direct lines that you can draw um, over hundreds of years sometimes. Exactly. Um, yeah. um, so I'm glad you related something that I, I was thinking about very well. <laughs> But it's also not demarcated so neatly, you know, like even if, if you ask somebody when the alignment period really began, when it ended, it's, you know, it's, it's really, it's not, it's not this neat kind of package. Um, it's just, it's just become a, a useful umbrella term for a set of ideals. And like any ideals, right, this is very Aristotelian, too much of it can be bad, everything in moderation. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of things that are they're in moderation, um, it seems like because we've had this very individualistic society, it, it, it almost seems like people are looping back into seeking identity. Um, but sometimes in, here in the West, I'm talking about for a moment, but sometimes in ways that are... Um, or you know, start to raise the level of, of religion or ignoring um, the facts on the ground or historical facts. I mean, there, it seems to me there is an effort underway to create a kind of pan Asian American identity, political identity, um, not in an individualist sense where you might draw on, I think we all do draw very heavily on our upbringing and our family traditions and maybe um, even in sort of uh, going into a, a larger group, like an ethnic tradition um, or a national tradition, but it, it, it seems like this is almost an artificially, an attempt to construct an artificially political identity for what are really a very diverse group of, um, of people who we call Asian in the United States. Yeah. Um, and, and actually Mike Gonzalez, uh, a great guy over at the Heritage Foundation has a fantastic book on this that I would I really recommend to folks um, out there. But I mean, do you, do you feel this kind of construction of an Asian identity? Um, do you think that Asian Americans of, of different kinds of ethnic stripes are, are going to buy into this kind of political identity? Um, or, or do you think that they will find it much like, uh, you know, a lot of a, a lot of um, Hispanic Americans find things like Latin Latinx, right? Um, apparently, nobody uses Latinx, right? Other than uh, mostly white uh, PhD students in in universities. Um, but how how do you think that effort to create a identity is is kind of falling on um, on on the various different peoples who we identify as Asian in the United States? So I did my homework and I read. Mike Gonzalez's piece, as you recommend it, on the invention of Hispanics. And he says this is a pan-ethnic group um, that doesn't even share, you know, language or really a culture um, or ethnicity. And, you know, I was thinking about the term Asian, and it's even worse <laughs> because at least Hispanic share one or two languages. You know, it's either going to be Spanish or Portuguese. Um, you cannot say the same at all for, for this umbrella term Asian, this pan-ethnic grouping, which includes Turkey, Russia, Indonesia, you know, Korea. It's, it's so diverse. And, you know, what it is, is, is an attempt to, it's a bureaucratic grouping, firstly, but what it is, 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 an, is an attempt to plug any new immigrant into the United States into the common struggle of, you know, everything has to come back. It's this grand narrative that, that everything has to go back to, okay, you know, this is the Chinese Exclusion Act, this is the kind of oppression you, your, your people face, this Asian kind of oppression. And it plugs everyone into a struggle that frankly is not shared. And it creates a very convenient voting block. 
Um, you know, it's, it's as Gonzalez explains in his book, um, it's, it's a way of drumming up grievances to recruit them for political ends. And, you know, as you have seen, like Asian now has kind of morphed into an even bigger group called AAPI, which stands for American Asian Pacific Islander, you know, because obviously the Japanese have a lot in common with uh, American Samoans. <laughs> so it makes no sense at all, but it is a political movement and you can see kind of how the forces are, are, are shaping up to, to make this a stronger identifier in hopes that people will will choose to identify with it. Um, and, you know, I, I don't actually think it's working, to be honest, because there's a huge gulf when it comes to Asian Americans, ha, I just use the term, but, but there's a huge gulf um, between the activist class, like the cultural elites, people you see in Hollywood, Asian American actors you see in Hollywood, um, sort of who is leading the nonprofit organizations like Stop AAPI Hate. There's a huge gulf between them and the people who are not cultural elites. You know, your, your recent immigrant, your, the, your Vietnamese family that owns a, a restaurant or a, a nail shop, the laundromats, they do not share or buy into the, the ideology of, you know, of, their, of their cultural elites. And um, it's, it's really hard to get even Asians to disengage from their, from their national origin groups. So Filipinos tend to identify with Filipino causes. Um, and as you, as the China issue kind of polarizes Asians, right, because China has alienated so many other regional countries in Southeast Asia, as I mentioned, the Vietnamese, um, the, the Thais, the, the Filipinos, um, there will, there will not be, an e they will not have an easy time trying to smooth all of that over and just say, oh yeah, you're all just Asian Americans. No, these differences are, are very real. And, and even, you know, Japanese versus um, Asian, uh, sorry, Japanese versus Chinese and Koreans, like that, there is historical baggage and current baggage there. And it's going to be very difficult for, for a pan-ethnic uh, identity to kind of smooth over all those differences. And neither should they, because, you know, at the end of the day, these categories end up flattening almost all individuality. Um, and it, you can't even understand, you know, so when you look at like statistics, like uh, who votes, who voted for Trump, for example, in 2020, and you look at Asian Americans as, as a group, I don't know what that tells you, but when you break it down into Vietnamese Americans, into um, Chinese Americans, some picture actually emerges. Well, it turns out the Vietnamese Americans voted for Trump in droves. And the reason for that was that Trump took a very hawkish stance on China. And so you understand things better when you break them down at a more granular level. And these larger categories are really kind of meaningless, except for, you know, trying to get, uh, pursue some sort of political objectives. And so recent narratives that the media has been trying to, you know, to inflame is that, um, the Asian Americans have, are a target um, because of, tr of Trump's rhetoric, um, especially when it comes to the China virus, Wuhan flu, um, that it, a lot of hate has been drummed up and therefore a lot of, you know, a lot of hate crimes against Asian Americans have been, you know, have been uh, perpetrated. And, and all this is somehow tied into white supremacy. It's blamed on white supremacy, even though people who have eyes can see that that's not what's happening. We see that on social media with, with videos coming out that go viral, but we also see that in the data that's actually reflected in the data. And so, you know, I think, I think it's really hard to, to gaslight people, but if the media keeps promoting this narrative, then, then, you know, it, it will become, it, it will be able to drum up these kinds of grievances and more and more, um, Asian immigrants could identify as Asian Americans and and feel that you know feel that oppression and internalize it and and vote in a way that will be very convenient to the progressives. So you actually um, you know sort of led the question I was going to go with next, which is exactly about the claims about um, AAPI uh, violence and hate crimes. I mean, what what is the truth about what's going on? Because we see one narrative, as you mentioned in the media, about you know blaming this on white supremacy. Um, it's it, it's not even. You tell me, because I'm I'm genuinely sort of I don't know how to dig out, or I haven't had the time to dig out what's actually a fact about these supposed hate crimes and what is just the media 
narrative on these things? I mean, is there a real documented increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans? And if so, does it have anything to do with, um, you know, the pandemic or coming initially, um, you know, res um, coming out of China? Um, or, or does it have to do with it as the, the left says, of Donald Trump's rhetoric. I mean, um, you know, what, what are the facts on the ground about the supposed surge in hate crimes? One of the one of the problems with the media narrative is because it looks racist, it is. And so they kind of run with that because, you know, it's a person of a different race attacking an Asian. Therefore, this is a racist attack. Um, but to really adjudicate whether something is a hate crime, you have to do a lot more. You have to understand the motivation of the person perpetrating the crime. And so, you know, uh, many of the DAs so far have not brought hate crime charges upon a lot of the viral videos that we've seen because is this something that was motivated racially or does it have something to do with many of these places like Chinatowns are actually located in urban centers. And we've seen statistics in the last year that that's in so many cities across America, crime has increased a thousand percent fold violent crime, murders, homicide, assaults, burglaries. And and how much of that is, you know, you have a very vulnerable population, um, older Asian folks kind of living in these Chinatowns. They don't speak English, they're meek. Um, many of them are known to, you know, not even use banks, they stuff money in their mattresses. So are these crimes of opportunity or are these crimes of racial prejudice? And I think it's very important to delineate this because the media simply, isn't. And so they're running away with the narrative that this has something to do with just pure racial prejudice. And maybe it's more complex. Maybe it's hard to entangle both of them. But we won't really know until hate crime statistics are officially released by the FBI in November, because that's when the FBI compiles everything and, and publishes it for the, the previous year. So in 2020, a lot of the a lot of what we're reacting to is actually self-reported incidents or data that is collected by a nonprofit called Stop AAPI Hate. Um, and I don't think that's reliable because many of the, the self-reported data includes things like verbal shunning, this person gave me a bad look, you know, and, and people feel judged. And so they're like, oh, I think that was a racist incident. It gets logged as a racist incident. Um, so I, I don't, I think we have to be very careful when we, when we, you know, try to evaluate what's going on. But, you know, from what we see on social media, it's heinous and it, you know, drums up a lot of emotional outrage. And I think it's plausible. It's plausible that, that you know, anti-Asian hate crimes are, are really rising. But I don't think we've done, a, you know, a good job delineating whether this is part of ambient rise in crime levels or whether this is purely motivated by, by racial hate. And the white supremacy narrative, to me, seems the most most unplausible narrative. And the reason being that it's it's really unlikely that people who live in these mostly Democrat progressive run cities, urban centers, are are listening or 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 you know or, or even find Donald Trump's words to be influenceable. So I don't think that, that that's actually what's happening here. It doesn't seem like it. And so to to kind of peg this as some sort of rise in white supremacy is it just it seems like a, a you know a totally false media constructed narrative. But to your earlier point, it does serve a political purpose of, of kind of forging this pan-Asian identity in victimhood in the United States in, as, as a way to um, make people, as you said, from vastly different backgrounds. Um, many of them, you know, are um, either immigrants or, or have in their family recent immigration. Most of them, um, a lot of people came well after the Chinese Exclusion Act, for example. Um, and uh, it, it, it is a way of, of sort of forging this, this connection, yeah. this collective connection between very, very different peoples uh, under the banner of victimhood. Um, but, but one thing that I wonder might, might shatter that a little bit um, that attempt, anyway, might be some of some of the questions surrounding uh, discrimination. Real, I would say the one real collective, modern um, sort of discrimination that is increasingly suffered by people in the AAPI category um, is largely in college admissions, uh, right. where we have seen elite colleges essentially peg a particular. They will not admit to doing this, but this is what the data show that they do peg a certain percentage of the student body um, uh, 
that that um, ends up being accepted. Um, for, so they have a, a certain kind of soft quota. Now, none of this is what they admit to doing, um, but there is a lot of evidence in the data that there is a soft quota for um, accepted Asian applicants in our universities. I mean, um, do you? Th how does that issue play into this? The sort of attempt to form a, an, a, a political identity for Asian Americans. I mean, this seems like a, a, an aspect of victimization that the people who are generally on the team of trying to form this kind of identity probably don't want to talk about. But it does seem to me that I I see more um, Asian American groups speaking out about this. So this is one of those issues that I mentioned to you before that that there's a big delta, there's a very big gulf between what the average, you know, Asian American person believes and what their cultural elites believe. And that is cultural elites, Asian American cultural elites support affirmative action. Um, they, they think that this model minority um, is just a myth that was created by the right to put a wedge between groups. Um, but the average Asian American, you know, they, the average Asian American is actually opposed to affirmative action. I mean, Prop 16 couldn't even pass in California in one of the most progressive states. So, uh, you know, it's increasingly becoming a, a wedge issue and, and um, also kind of ironic because the group that, you know, the people that say stop AAPI, I hate, uh, we are against Asian American discrimination, ignores this almost systematic form of discrimination that's going on, not just in colleges, but, but now also spreading to K-12. It shows up in different ways. One way that's showing up in K-12 is, you know, you have a lot of these tests like uh, for Stuyvesant, for example, in New York City. Um, they want to abolish these entrance tests. And so when, when you have a single test that allows uh, admissions to a school, what happens is when there's overrepresentation of Asians, then the test is invalid and they want to cancel it. Um, or they're removing, you know, for example, gifted classes. I think the, the state of Virginia, you know, is deciding to roll back on gifted math classes. Um, and so there's a whole host of, of um, you know, sort of admissions policies now, tests, testing, sort of reactions to testing that that the country is is basically waging a war on merit. And the reason for doing that is because, you know, of this overrepresentation of Asians in education and in, in academic uh, settings. And, you know, this is, it, it flies in the face of, of fairness to do something like this. And it, it just reeks of discrimination to have these kind of racial quotas. And, I, I definitely agree with you because I am seeing more Asian Americans kind of and Asian immigrants push back on, on this narrative because their success as a minority group um, is kind of throwing a wrench into the whole narrative of critical race theory, you know, that pretty much all disparities that you see between groups uh, have to do with uh, systematic uh, sort of discrimination only. And, and the performance of Asian Americans speak otherwise. Um, and, and so more and more people, especially those with kids in school, are, are organizing. And so I, I'm really happy to see, you know, groups kind of come out of the woodwork, parents saying, you know, this is a really bad direction for us to go into. Um, one school in Washington state actually started labeling Asian students as white, um, just so that, you know, the way that diversity is considered would not count the Asian American kids. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of noise was made and the, the school decided to unpublish that, that report. And so pressure like that works, awareness like that works, um, sort of the, the drive to paint um, things like academic success, kind of the, the values that Asian American uh, families are, are really hold on to as white supremacist culture kind of uh, values is very dangerous. And we are starting to see that with, uh, you know, kind of the, the critical race advocates. Um, and I think it is going to do not just our kids a really, you know, disservice, but the future of the country. I mean, and, you know, to our previous conversation, like we're not just competing with ourselves here. And it's not, you know, it, we're in competition, global competition with, with China, 
And if our students are not prepared for the future, our entire country is at stake. I, could, I couldn't agree more with that, that last statement, both internally and externally, right? Internally, uh, because we are a large multi-ethnic liberal democracy and there has to be a sense of fairness, as I think you so rightly pointed to, um, it, among our, our sort of diverse population, or we are going to be in constantly at each other's throats domestically. And, and then, as you say, um, it's not just us in the world. And if, if we are, are futzing around with this stuff and at each other's throats, then um, we are going to definitely lose out in some of these global competitions and, and hopefully, even, um, you know, potentially uh, not even worse, right, into a real open conflict well, uh, Melissa, it's been so wonderful to have you here at High Noon um, and to get your insights. Where can people find you, your work, and, and uh, learn more about, about what you do? You can find me on Twitter. Um, I'm usually, I'm not as active as, as most people are, but my Twitter handle is at Miss, M-S, Melchen, M-E-L-C-H-E-N. Um, and, you know, in terms of writing, just find me on Spectator. Uh, there's like an author page and you can see all my articles there. Um, I am starting to write more for, for the New York Post as well recently. So, um, and as for, you know, the advocacy stuff that I do on the side, um, Ideas Beyond Borders is one. Um, that's the one that Inez referenced. And, and the other one is FAIR, the Foundation Against uh, Intolerance and Racism. Well, thanks again for, for joining us. And um, thank you to all of our listeners. New episodes of High Noon come out every Wednesday. So please join us next week for an upliftingly practical and energized discussion um, about critical race, race theory with Christopher Rufo, who was, is our next guest. Um, Till then, you can find High Noon anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or IWF.org. So smash that subscribe button, or even better, leave us a review. Um, you can send comments or questions for the show to inez.stepman at iwf.org as well. Till then, be brave, and I'll see you next time on High Noon.